We're in Revelation 13, <clears throat> and as noted, as noted last week, not going to be in a real hurry to get through this chapter. So last week we got basically one phrase of verse 1. This week we will get uh, the rest of verse 1 and chapter 2, or rather verse 2, in our sights. Revelation 13, hope you have uh, your handout and ready to fill in some blanks here in just a second. By the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, and by the time the midpoint is met, um, the man who becomes the beast will be without question. I think the whole world will know by that time that this is the man of sin. He will be known uh, on two, uh, very evident for both audiences, the saved and the lost. Those who are tribulation saints during this time will recognize him as the one who is leading the charge against the tribulation saints. And then those who are not saved will be recognizing him as the leader that the world has needed and wanted for so long. Unfortunately, it is the false god as uh, the real God, Jesus, is still a few years away from making his appearance for the second time. So from our previous message, this man of sin or man who goes into perdition will be widely known, if not known worldwide. One of the cool things about living in our day and time is we can know exactly how that's going to happen. So 40 or 50 years ago, had no idea other than a television set that you still had to get up and walk over and change. If you wanted to turn it up or turn it down, there wasn't any clicker, you know? How many of you were the clicker? Yeah, that, that's, that's all us. We, that's our generation, right? But, uh, uh, but anyway... So, 40, 50 years ago, we wouldn't have even had a clue that you can get out your cell phone and find out anything that's going on anywhere around the world, you know? But here we are. So, this man of sin will already be popular and, I believe, very powerful on the world stage. And... Without the curbing of evil through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Remember we talked about the Holy Spirit's absence because of the rapture. And once the rapture happens, the presence of the Holy Spirit within us goes away into heaven. He, the Antichrist, or the man of sin, will preside over a desperately wicked world. Ultimately, his wickedness will, be, uh, will open the door for an ultimate the devil's habitation of his body. The man of sin will become inhabited by the most evil spirit imaginable so that he performs for Satan all of his wicked schemes. Now, think back with me for just a moment. All the way back into the days of Pharaoh, when Moses went up and said, Let my people go, and threw down his stick, and it became a snake. That was pretty amazing, right? But even the possessed magicians of Pharaoh were able to do the same thing with their sticks. Do you remember that? So, don't think that the devil doesn't have some power. Now, ultimately, as the plagues went on, it's obvious that once there were lice and flies and frogs and all that sort of stuff going on, I don't think the magicians, I don't think Pharaoh was like, hey, why don't you make some more frogs, guys? You know, because that uh, that's pretty gross, actually, if you think about it. But ultimately, they weren't able to do everything that God's man did, but they were certainly able to duplicate a lot of miracles. So, with that in mind, Note that in this day, 
Satan's power will be as unlimited as it's ever been. And through the man of sin, ultimately the beast, the Antichrist, of Revelation 13, many things will happen through this guy that even to this day we're really not sure to the extent of how powerful he will really be. That, as they say, still remains to be seen. And we'll see that one instance, especially next week in verse 3. This continues the scene then at the midpoint of the seven years, and he is allowed to rule these final three and a half years with all chaos and as the God of the world. As noted, from verse 1, he comes up out of the sea. This denotes that he is likely going to be a Gentile or, at the very least, identify himself as a Gentile. What his long-lost lineage will be will only remain to be seen. Many educated people think he's going to be mostly of Greek descent. I don't know. Can't really argue with that because I don't have much to argue with. You know, I don't much have much ammunition. It's kind of like when I try to argue with Kim. I just don't have much ammunition. She's a much better arguer than I am. So this would make sense, though, because of John's instruction from Revelation 11, 2. Uh, 1 and 2, actually, of course, when the, the temple is measured and, and God says, don't measure the outside court because that's the court of the Gentiles and they're going to have their way for three and a half years. So this leads John to write the description of the beast. Verse 1 of chapter 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And uh, this beast now, here's his description which we will detail tonight. He's got seven heads and ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Let's take this remaining part of the verse and begin to decipher a few of these things about the Antichrist slash beast. Okay, first of all, the Bible says he's got seven heads. All right, that's where we start tonight. He has seven heads. Now, obviously, these are not real heads. Otherwise, he would be one weird dude. And weird looking to boot. But this is figuratively speaking that he has seven heads. Uh, remembering back to Revelation 12 Three, we actually see a theme or a pattern. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. So there is a theme developing here with the numbers seven and ten. And that, by the way, harkens all the way back to the book of Daniel. Daniel speaks of this 7 and 10 combination as well. So here we are. The number 7 represents past world empires plus 1. Okay, so the number 7 represents past world empires. And I'll give you just a second to write these down. They are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, Greece, and Rome. You will note that's only six. Egypt, in charge in, under the aforementioned Moses' time. Assyria, 
they were the ruling nation at the time of the fall of the northern kingdom, Israel or Ephraim. Babylon overcame Assyria, and they were who overcame Judah, destroying the temple and becoming the world power under Nebuchadnezzar. The Medo-Persian Empire overcame the Babylonian Empire literally overnight, and kings like Ahasuerus from Esther were kings during the Medo-Persian Empire. Greece is famous for whom? Come on, world history people. Alexander the Great. Um, so that's pretty much all you need to say about Greece. They were in charge for a while, world power. And then ultimately Rome, who would have been the world power all the way into the days of Jesus and post-Jesus. And then ultimately just kind of dissolved. Didn't really ever get conquered by anyone. That leads us to know that the seventh would be a still-to-come empire. And it will be a revival of the way that the old Roman Empire was set up. We are here seeing the described ruler here, and he is called the beast. Okay? And so those are the seven heads. The picture being drawn for us is that there will be a little piece of each of these world powers within this beast. Um, Egypt hated the Jews. The Antichrist will hate the Jews. Um, let's go to Greece. Alexander the Great. Remember, he conquered the known world in record time on top of his big black horse named... Anybody remember? I'd be really impressed if you did. I'm not going to try to spell it, I'll say that. But his name was Bucephalus. It's a big black horse that only he could tame as a teenager. This horse was hated by everybody and Alexander the Great as a teenager went into the horse barn and, and saw this big black horse over there and just went right up to him and just started patting him. And, just, and so he, they became companions for all of the battles that they would fight together. And so uh, with great swiftness, the Antichrist, the beast, will conquer the world, literally. Okay, so, so he'll take with these seven heads a little bit of all of these nations and rule as the head, the leader of the world. Okay, the next phrase then, having seven heads, ten horns are next. So ten horns are the next phrase there. And horns will always represent power in the Bible. Horns, as with an animal who has them, provide both defense and offense defense and offense have you ever watched the uh animal planet or something when the the horns especially the big horn sheep are fighting over the good looking girl and they lock horns and the noise that that makes even through your television is just absolutely like either amazingly gross or amazingly beautiful. I don't know which. Uh, deer are very famous for, you know, fighting over the mistresses. Um, when Andrew was a little tyke, I know he probably hates the fact that he's on staff for this reason, that I continue to tell you Andrew's stories, but he was a cute little kid. We were out at Will Rogers' farm in northeastern Oklahoma, and I say that because Lake Uliga actually was built over his actual farm so they moved his farm a little out and they still have a working farm and all this kind of stuff from you know will rogers the great cartoonist and everything from back in the day 
Well, we were out at the farm just visiting with, actually it was Kent York that was with us. He was doing a, a revival meeting for us, and, and uh, we were out there just kind of seeing stuff. It's really cool, all the things they've got set up out there and everything. Well, then you get to the little barn area, and there's a bunch of little pygmy goats out there. Well, Andrew's only about this tall, so he's like digging in, man. He loves these little pygmy goats, but he just keeps aggravating one. And he's over there yanking on its horns and just having a great time. And so, so uh, and this, he wasn't hurting anything, but it was kind of funny to watch this goat just kind of start getting a little aggravated. And so Andrew gets bored, you know, as all two-year-olds get bored after a little while, maybe three. And he walks off. Well, that goat didn't forget it as he went and rammed into <laughs> Andrew with his horn. So there was defense and offense with the little pygmy goat that was out at... Uh, uh, Will Rogers Farm. Funny story. Andrew, thankfully, does not remember much of his childhood up until he is about six years old. So I have to, as his dad, I have to remind him of these things from time to time. You understand? He doesn't know if it's really the truth or if I'm just making something up. By the way, the number 10 symbolizes the totality of the beast's backing. Okay, so... In the old Roman Empire, there would have been ten federations, more or less. And with the fact that he now has the ten horns, makes us realize that these ten conglomerations of the revived Roman Empire federations will be behind him until they're not. And then we'll see that coming ultimately there'll be a little bit of a rebellion but it'll be taken care of very quickly because of the man in charge the antichrist um, human military forces and political powers will unite then behind this beast antichrist uh, again the number 10 actually harkens all the way back to Daniel chapter 2 when Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream remember the big statue dream that he has that Nebuchadnezzar has that he can't get any interpreters for he's going to kill all the wise guys because they can't interpret the dream and Daniel said why we got to why do we got to die and they revealed why and Daniel goes I tell you what give me the night and I'll tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream tomorrow and so the dream was all about this humongous statue that represented Nebuchadnezzar the Medo-Persian Empire Greece uh, and ultimately there were the ten toes Remember the ten toes, which were of a mixture of clay and iron. And so the ten toes or the ten toe federation that is going to be extremely strong, but also extremely vulnerable. And that goes all the way back to Daniel chapter 2. As I was just kind of referencing back and forth in my study today, it still is absolutely amazing to me that Daniel saw the whole world before Jesus was even born. And how this is all unfolding right before our very eyes. And it was talked about several hundred years before Christ. Amazing. Daniel was telling of powers that were coming to be that weren't even, weren't even born yet. Weren't even thought about. So again, the ten-toe configuration of that beast in the, uh, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar becomes the then future description of Rome. It allows us to see what is coming in the revived Roman Empire. Again, as described by Daniel, Rome will have then strength and also weakness as the makeup of the toes is both of iron and also of clay. A further reference into Daniel shows that the beast will actually rise out of this ten-nation confederation. Do you want to see that for yourself? Let's, let's go back to Daniel for a second. Uh, Daniel is right after Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And chapter 7 Verses 24 and 25 is where we see that this Antichrist will come out of these ten or this ten group 
Confederation. So verses 24 and 25 of Daniel 7, the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first. He shall subdue three kings. Remember I told you there's going to be all four of them until they're not. He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Verses 24 and 25 of Daniel's Old Testament prophecy tell us exactly what's going on in Revelation. A time, a time, and a half a time is three and a half years. And now in Revelation we're talking about the last three and a half years. It's amazing how the Bible fits together and how we are challenged then to know. But of course what we also see in verse 24 is that 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 horn comes out of the ten horn federation okay so that's the ten horns then back in chapter 13 verse 1 seven heads ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns ten crowns bless you we do know that crowns have always been the symbol of of the one in charge the one in charge we might of course think of kings and queens with their crowns in light of this and the fact then that the beast has all ten crowns is very significant upon his Horns, ten crowns. It means that all ten leaders of the revived Roman Empire will or will be forced, ultimately, to give the beast their power and their authority. Now, the foreshadowing in Daniel a minute ago was that three come against him, right? Well, that's going to happen here pretty soon. In fact, I think it happens at the end of chapter 13, But, as you might expect, since the devil's in charge now, anybody that comes against the devil is going to be extinguished. Okay? So, either by will or by force, he will ultimately have all of the ten crowns and be the man in charge. Verse 1 concludes, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Or, I guess we could say, since he's got more than one head, the names of blasphemy. Blasphemy, by the way, is the act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or the things of God. So on his head will be a crown. And on that crown will be something or some words that are blasphemous. And on this crown and through his actions acting out what is on this crown will be his way of saying, I am the one in charge. So John is the revelator right john is who wrote the revelation correct okay john also wrote the gospel which includes many i am's in it we've talked about probably the most important one for the last three sundays i am the way the truth and the life i am the vine I am the bread. We talked about that a little bit on Sunday. Um, Can you think of some other I am's from John? I am the door. That's a really good one. I am the shepherd, or the good shepherd. Who said that one? That was a really good one. Yeah. 
I am the living water, bread of life. He says over and over again. I think I might have told you this a few weeks ago studying this, but in the book of John, you ought to do a study sometime where all you look for is the I am's. Jot them all down as you see them come up. So they are over and over and over again. Well, just think of it this way. The beast, the Antichrist, is going to say, I am all those things. And I just want you to know right now, it, when the beast stands up and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I'm going to want to punch somebody. So get away from me in heaven. All right? Because that's just not cool. There is only one way. There is only one truth. There is only one life, and that's Jesus Christ. So the blasphemous ways of the beast will be known by what he's wearing the crown on his head and so he will himself believe literally that he is god and act that way that's a lot that's a lot to take and that's a lot to think about so very quickly let's get to verse 2 this won't take but just a second And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Okay, I, I kind of ran out of room, so all you're going to get is the character of the beast. But I would like you to jot these down. Okay, the character of the beast, and you got a little bit of room down there below that which will allow you to write down the uh, images here. And by the way, similar images are found in Daniel's description of the then future world powers, post-Daniel. History records the truths of his writings, his prophecies coming true. Uh, the beast will resemble some of those ancient powers that Daniel speaks of. The leopard symbolizes Greece so just write that down the leopard symbolizes Greece as noted just a few minutes ago he will swiftly conquer just as Alexander the Great swiftly conquered where Alexander the Great conquered on a horse the beast will likely conquer using military power uh, far-reaching satellite type situations where he can be literally everywhere in the world at the same time one of the things that came out of 9 11 traffic cameras cameras watching everywhere guess who's going to be in charge of that not the good guys anymore if they ever were but that's another story not to be a conspiracy theorist but, you know, the leopard symbolizes Greece. The bear reminds us of the Media Persian Empire. The Medes and the Persians, the bear. And he'll have a lot of that in him, too, as their time, the Media Persian Empire, was known for great strength and stability, especially the strength part. The stable part will be because the Antichrist will literally be infused with the devil. And the devil has a very stable mission to steal, kill, destroy. Okay? The lion draws us back to the Babylonian Empire. The lion. The Babylonian Empire was probably the strongest empire the world has ever known. Under Nebuchadnezzar's rule, they were a fierce and all-consuming power that spread their kingdom far and wide. In fact, I'm reading Ezekiel right now, watching how the Babylonian Empire just keeps picking off nation after nation after nation. The lion, the Babylonian Empire. All of this power is, according to the end of this verse, given to the beast 
by the dragon. The end of the verse, and the dragon gave him, the beast, his power, his seat, and great authority. How do we know that? Because he has now come in and inhabited him. And by the way, this sets up now the first two parts of the unholy trinity. The Holy Trinity is what? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Satan's not real clever. He's just an imitator. And so what he's trying to do is set up the unholy trinity. Remember, he is in charge now. God's given him free reign on the earth. And so what's he do? He tries to be God and tries to create an unholy trinity. Actually, is successful in doing so. Seeing himself as God, he's the dragon, he's Satan, he's the devil. Now we have a clear picture of the one he is going to use in human form to blaspheme his way to getting people to worship him, follow him, the Antichrist. So you got the anti-God and the Antichrist. By the end of the chapter, we'll have the anti-Holy Spirit. He's known as the false prophet. And that's where we're heading. But we've got some pretty interesting things to get to before we get there. And that's where we've got to stop tonight. So, Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. It is... Uh, it is certainly alive, it's certainly powerful, it's certainly true. I mean, how many hundreds of years were between Daniel and Revelation, and they're both talking about the same thing because it came from you, the same God. And so I pray in the midst of everything that's going on in our lives, we would get a hold of your unchanging hand. And the things that we are seeing here, we would uh, do our very best to make sure the people around us aren't seeing this in real life someday. That they'll be actually in heaven with us. Motivate us, prompt us through learning about these things in your word which is the truth for it's in jesus name i pray amen